I've just put homework. Um, I guess it's homework nine. You just did homework eight, right? I just put homework nine online, uh, the next WMS assignment. So it's due on Monday of next week and also is exam two uh, on Monday of next week. And um, so I'll give you more information on Friday about that exam, but it's just basically covering all of the materials since the uh, first midterm exam that we had. So if we look at the schedule for the semester, then uh, we'll be able to see the topics that we've covered since the first exam. So our first exam was on class number 12. So basin losses and excess, hydrographs, the NRCS rainfall runoff model, unit hydrograph calculation, time of concentration, and then the, uh, the watershed modeling stuff that we've done until now. So you should bring your laptop computer to the exam with WMS installed uh, because I will have one simple activity I'll ask you to do during the test to assess where things are at with you WMS proficiency. So we'll have that exam on Monday of next week. Today what we're going to do is go through two different models for calculating the uh, peak runoff from a watershed. We're going to look at how to set up the rational method in WMS and calculate the peak flow rate from that. And then we'll also use a different model, the National Stream Flow Statistics. And we talked about NSS in a previous class and how every state has a different regression equation that's been done. So we'll look at how that's implemented in WMS. Uh, before we start with the program, are there any schedule or announcement questions that people have? For exam two, is it the same kind of formula sheet deal as the first one? Remind me, what was the deal on the first one? Oh, my bad. We had a, a formula sheet, one page front and back. You were allowed to prepare yeah. front and back of one page? Yeah, you can do that again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, remember, on the first exam, and on this, this one as well, you shouldn't put any conceptual information. And so what I mean by that is don't define terminology, um, don't explain concepts, that what you prepare on that formula sheet should be formulas. And then uh, define variables. You can include the units that go into the variables. If you want to outline a step-by-step -step solution process, you can do that, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't include terminology because I'm going to give you some concept questions that I want to uh, figure out what you actually know and not just what you copy off of a formula sheet as far as the conceptual understanding. So let me put a note on here to remind myself you may prepare one page of equations, variable definitions, units, All right. <clears throat> That's a good question. So other questions? All right. Um, rational method, we've talked about before. Uh, one of the limitations of the rational method is the size of the watershed. And different states and jurisdictions have different expectations on what's the allowable upper maximum for modeling with the rational method. On one end of the spectrum, the state of Maine, their Department of Transportation suggests that 20 acres is the upper maximum they'd like to see modeled with a rational method. Um, whereas Oregon and Texas are at the other end of the spectrum with 200 acres, Maricopa County, Arizona, a little bit in between at 160. The state of West Virginia in their drainage manual, I wasn't able to find them articulating what's the upper maximum. But they do have a pretty useful table of C values. And so for the watershed we're going to look at today, it's just uh, considered woods. And it's a steep area where the slope is more than 10%. And so they're suggesting in a case like that, that the C value should be 0.35. So that's what we're going to do today when we go to this little watershed by the mall. 
we're going to apply a C value of 0.35, and I'm going to show you how WMS calculates time of concentration, how it gets the rainfall data, because you know where Q equals C I A, just to drive this point home once again, CFS is the flow rate units that you get when you multiply a unitless C value. I has units of inches per hour, and then area would be in units of acres. So by happy coincidence, if you multiply inches per hour by acres, then you'll get something very close within 1% equal to CFS. Uh, of course, you can do it by calculating the area in square feet and the intensity in feet per hour, uh, and then convert how many seconds are there in an hour, and you get the same cubic feet per second. But um, what WMS will do, I've told you that it's a preprocessor, that it goes in, does the legwork of obtaining data for you. And so the heaviest lifting it does is getting the elevation data, and later on when we have it calculate the curve number, it'll go get soil type and land use data for us. That's a really nice thing. It'll also get us the rainfall intensity data. And I mean, that's cool. It'll save us five minutes. Uh, we could go and get it ourselves from the national, uh, excuse me, from the precipitation data frequency server, but it saves us from that step. So I'll show you how it goes and queries that database and gets the intensity for us. The uh, intensity that it's going to use when the, applying the rational method is the rainfall intensity that corresponds to the watershed's time of concentration. So also built into WMS is you can choose from any of the time of concentration or lag time calculating methods. So remember how there's <coughs> kinematic wave, the Kirby method, Kerpich, um, FAA method, uh, SES method. There's a lot of different methods for calculating the time of concentration. There, all those formulas are built into WMS and based on the geometry of the watershed and or values that you put in, it'll calculate the time of concentration for you and then it'll select the appropriate rainfall intensity that goes along with that. All right, so this is the area that we're going to look at today. Um, it is if you've been over by the mall, do you know where Buffalo Wild Wings is by the mall? So on the other side of that is the Mud River. And um, so it's this little stream that comes into the Mud River. There's a watershed here that we're going to delineate. So when we uh, locate our project area, we'll pull up you know, in the uh, data lake locator tool. We'll just kind of look for where are the ridgelines to make sure that we're zoomed out enough that we have the entire watershed area. So let's start a new file here in the hydrologic modeling wizard. Create maybe a new subfolder with today's date so that you could come back to this later. 3-6-24. I'll call this file Wednesday. And once we click save here is when it actually creates it. Okay, we're still in zone 17. And um, I got a couple of questions as people were working on the email where they were getting an error related to the elevation and horizontal units being in different units. And so make sure that you've got your units here set to meters and that you have the NAVD 88 datum specified. All right, so for the uh, boundaries of the project, previously in class, I think we were in Ona. If we just zoom out a little bit, here's the mall. You can see it's a flat area that's got some buildings on it. I mean, if you just type in Barbersville, so what would it jump to if we tell it Barbersville? Okay. So we're going to zoom in on this mall area, and it's Wildcat Hollow is the wa watershed that we want to delineate. And so here you can see, here's the western ridge line of that watershed. Here's the northern boundary of the watershed. Here's the 
the eastern side of that watershed boundary. So this will have all the data. If I zoomed in even further, I don't have it. You know, I, I, I'm missing it at the top and at the bottom. So it looks like this is the, this is the appropriate zoom level to make sure that I capture all of the data and I'm able to get the tributary before it gets into the Mud River. So have your uh, locator set to approximately this. It doesn't matter if it's over here or over here, just so long as the watershed is included in what we're gonna download. Okay, so we're gonna use the web services and the only data that we need is the worldwide elevation data. So click download data from web. It'll have that pop up to suggest a resolution of 15 meters based on how closely we're zoomed in. You could choose a different one if you want to have a little more elevation precision, but 15 meters will be perfectly fine for us today. So click OK. It's downloading it. it takes a moment. We get the contours there. So the next step is to run Topaz. And um, rather than square miles, I just I want to see the area of the watershed in acres. And so I'm going to change this to acres. If I remember correctly, this watershed has an area of around 500 acres. So we'll compute topaz. And um, it's going to show us a lot of blue, I think, because I've got right now the accumulation threshold set so small, you know, 0 0.003 acres, anything that's less than a hundredth of an acre, it thinks that's where a stream is going to accumulate. So let's change that maybe to five acres and apply it. That looks a lot more reasonable. So this is that stem that we want to model. And in fact, I'll show you there's a road crossing. If there's a culvert that goes under that road or a small bridge, it's that hydraulic structure that I want to know what's the flow rate of the water when the water gets to that. And I think, if I remember correctly, in that location, it's a small bridge. So uh, let's close this for a moment. Turn off the uh, color map in the background. So under GIS data, if you deselect that and turn off that elevation heat map, and let's turn on a road map. So here at the top, get online maps and do the world street map so that we can zoom in a little bit closer and just make sure that we drop our outlet at the perfect location where the stream is going under the road. So here's the watershed and I'm going to I'm going to just zoom in on this part. So it's partly by the mall but the reason why I'm zooming in is do you see how the stream is going under this road? So Wildcat Hollow and Mud River Road come together, and this is Old Guyane River Road. So if these three roads come together, and the, the stream is going under the road. So there's a, there's a small bridge at this location, and it's right here that I want to delineate. So if I go back to the wizard and drop the outlet location, so you can always move back and forth using the back and next buttons or you can just choose whichever screen you want to see on the left side. So choose outlet locations and I'm going to create an outlet point right here where the water from that Wildcat watershed is going under the Wildcat Hollow Road. So click on the outlet there and then on the next stream, the next screen is where we can delineate the watershed. Just click delineate watershed. It'll report the area in acres, 557 acres. All right. So just things to be looking out for. You know, if we had all of a sudden a flat boundary at the top, that would mean that you didn't have all of the elevation data that you needed. If there's ever just an unusually flat surface after you've delineated a watershed, it means you need to either pan or zoom out a little bit more to get all of the applicable elevation data that's inside your watershed. So does everybody have the watershed delineated? All right, let's be sure and save the work because you never know when WMS is going to crash. Usually 
when you haven't saved your work. So what you're doing when you click on the save button is you're making sure that it's not going to crash. Um, so we open up the wizard again. And uh, so we've just delineated the watershed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next step is to initialize the model. Uh, this step, it doesn't actually do a lot. It's just you're telling it whether which of these models you're going to choose for um, calculating the flow rates. So rational is the first one that we're going to do. So choose rational and then initialize model data. Basically, when you click initialize model data, it's just switching you over to the hydrologic modeling module. Previously, we may have been in the drainage module. It puts you into the hydrologic modeling module. So it just changes the menu structure a little bit. When you're in different modules, see how the, the menu options change? If you're in this one versus that one or that one, um, we'll get more into that later. You don't have to know about it now as long as you're just running things through the wizard. But when we initialize the model data, it put us into the hydrologic modeling module. And by saying initialize model data, it's just basically activating certain variables that we now have to define. define. It's putting like a zero into that variable um, as a placeholder. So close this window. And just uh, this is a little tricky. Let me see if I can move it out of the way so that I can show you. There's a symbol here for a basin. It's like a, a brown rectangle. And they unfortunately, it's right under the labels. So here where it's got the area and the maximum flow distance, there's this basin symbol behind it. And if you select it or double click it, so if you double click, then it brings up this menu here for the rational method. Another place where you can get at the rational method is under models. Um, well, maybe you can't. We'll just double click on the uh, double click on that icon. It brings up the rational method. What you'll see is it already has filled in the area. By the way, was everybody able to get the rational method window open? Anybody need help with that? Because it is a little bit tricky just double clicking in the right spot to get it to pop up. But it's filled in the area. So 557 acres is known. But there's some other things that it has no idea based on the data that's available or the calculations it's done so far. It doesn't know what the C value is. I wrote on the whiteboard earlier that, you know, the state of West Virginia suggests that for woods, which is mostly what this watershed is, this watershed has, you know, maybe 1%, if maybe less than 1% of the area is asphalt and uh, roof area. So less than 1% of it is impervious. All the rest of it is just raw land. So I think 0.35 is a good runoff coefficient. So type that in here under runoff coefficient, 0.35. And um, rainfall intensity is going to be an iterative process based on the time of concentration. So first things first, let's compute the time of concentration. So you'll see here it says compute based on basin data. So click Compute for Basin Data. And it brings up some options for how it could either calculate time of concentration or lag time. And then remember that they only, those two are related by a factor of either 3 fifths or 5 thirds. The time of concentration is 5 thirds times the lag time. And some formulas will calculate the lag time for you. Some formulas will calculate time of concentration for you. Let's have the lag time be what we're calculating. And we'll do it according to the SCS method. The SCS method is good for calculating the lag time because it uses the watershed slope. And it already here is filling in that it's 31.8%. It detected that from all the elevation data that's in the background. It had automatically calculated for us 
the watershed slope. It knows the length of the watershed, a hydraulic length, eight, nine, six, seven feet. What it doesn't know, though, is the curve number. We could go and calculate the curve number if we got the land use and soil type data. What I happen to know about this watershed and most in the region is that they have a curve number of about 68. So let's just, for purposes of calculating the lag time, let's hear where it says variable value zero, type in 68. All right, so 68 and then okay. When you click OK, now it's estimated the time of concentration is 45.8 minutes. So why do we need to know the time of concentration? We need to know it because we're going to go to an IDF table and find out what is the rainfall intensity that should be used. And the rainfall intensity that we use goes along with whatever return period we're interested in and this time of concentration. So does anybody have questions about how we use the basin data to calculate the time of concentration? Basin data, lag time, SCS method, and then just select the CN. And when you're on that row, you can overwrite the variables. Like we could, if we wanted, overwrite the watershed slope. But it's already calculated that based on the physical data that's available. So the only thing it didn't know yet was the curve number, and let's just go with 68. Okay, so the time of concentration is 48 minutes. Now, if you, if you click on compute IDF curves, so compute, it brings up this window where it's gonna go to the precipitation data frequency server and get the intensity duration frequency values for us. And then it'll do that interpolation that is a little bit tedious if we have to do it manually, it's gonna do it all for us. And so you look that there's a variety of ways to define the IDF curve. You could define your own IDF curve if you wanted, but select Hydro 35. So that is the underlying data set for the precipitation data frequency server. It's called Hydro 35. And then click Get Online Data. And when you do, it's going to, this graph right now that's empty, it's going to create a bunch of intensity, duration, frequency curves. And then this window, which was previously empty, we've got the return periods, two years, five years, 10 years, durations. So if we select 10 year, we want to find out what is the 10 year peak flow according to the rational method, then I've got the data. I selected 10-year row. It's going to use the 45.9 minutes time of concentration and then click Compute Intensity. It may have already computed it earlier. It just finds, like, what's the intensity that goes along with this time of concentration? So <clears throat> it's going and finding 2.271 inches per hour is the intensity that we're going to put into the rational method. So click done. It puts in the intensity. So Q equals CIA. The C value, we said 0.35. The intensity, it is a two-part process. First, calculating the time of concentration. Second, selecting which return period. In our case, we're going to do the 10-year return period. And then it finds what is the intensity that goes along with that return period, so 2.271 inches per hour. Area, 557 acres. And so down at the bottom, see where it says flow rate? So the peak flow rate, it's calculation, calculating 447, 447 CFS. What's the typical upper limit for the rational method? Like the most generous states, Texas and Oregon, what did they say was the upper limit? 200 acres. We're more than double that. So as a consequence, what the rational method tends to do is overestimate the peak flow rate. If you use a watershed that's too big, 
more likely than not, this is probably an overestimation. So probably this is an overestimation. It's always good to look at things from different methods to do calculations with a different approach. And so it's good that we're also going to be looking at national stream flow statistics today because what we'll be able to do is we'll say, let's utilize a completely independent method that's separate from all of the things that we've just done. And let's calculate what's the peak flow according to national stream flow statistics. And then that would maybe give us a bounds, you know, so if we've got one value that we think is probably too high, what is it, triple? Is it double? Is it 50% too high? Let's look at national stream flow statistics just as another data point, and then that would give us an idea maybe of, uh, of what the scatter looks like. But uh, before we move on to national stream flow statistics, are there any questions so far? Yeah. Um, it just automatically calculates it once you've typed in the runoff coefficient, the intensity, and the area. So it takes, what's that? 0.35. Yeah, you don't have a telescope back there? It's probably pretty small, right? Yeah, because the default value when we clicked initialize model, it just wrote a zero to that C value. So you have to overwrite that zero with a C value that's positive before it will. <clears throat> There's one more thing that WMS can do that's worth telling you about, and that is it can create a hydrograph, like a picture of time versus Q. This right here that it's calculated is just the value of the peak flow. but. What if we wanted a graph of that, a visual of some sort? So here where it says compute hydrographs, just click on compute. And then it's going to ask you, um, well, if you've got multiple basins, how they should be added together. So I think we can just say done, because we only have a single basin. So there's not any routing that we need to do or combinations. Now. There's now a little cursor, or not a cursor, there's now a, a little icon next to our model. So if you click OK to close the rational method window and double click on that hydrograph, then it's got a, a hydrograph for us like that. Um, let's delete it though, delete that one. Earlier, I was able to get a much better hydrograph than that one. <clears throat> so the rational method of hydrograph is triangular. Um, Well, I won't get too worked up about the hydrograph. Oh, OK, now this gave me a curved linear one. So you can get different shapes depending on which of these. Uh, let me delete the previous one. So depending on which of the, whether universal, modified, decalb, and so on, you don't necessarily have to stick with the uh, triangular hydrograph. I guess it's just the universal that's giving an adjusted shape. And so the advantage of the universal method is that the, uh, the tail end of the hydrograph that we know just based on experience that when the rain stops, it takes a lot longer for the watershed to drain until the flow rates are low again than it does for that peak to arrive. This is just a way of kind of estimating that. But it still sets the peak to what we had calculated and know 447 CFS. Um, 
All right, so that was the rational method. Let's now look at national stream flow statistics. National stream flow statistics is an independent way that's just based on the area of the watershed. And remember that it comes from a publication that's put together by the uh, Soil Conservation Service in West Virginia. It's this publication that comes from 2010, Estimation of Flood Frequency Discharges for Rural Unregulated Streams. We've got three different zones, and when we use WMS, we're going to have to tell it which zone we want to use. So in Cabell County, we are in the Western Plateau. Remember, we had the choices of either the Eastern Panhandle, Central Mountains, and Western Plateau. So when we uh, select the National Stream Flow Statistics, not only are we going to have to know which publication to go from, so the one we're going to do is this 2010 publication, because it has all of the old equations available as well, in case you wanted to find out what's the predicted flow rate according to the technique that was in place in 1983 or something like that. We'll do the newest and latest, greatest, uh, most accurate regressions that are published for NSS. So um, go into the hydrologic modeling module. I think that's where we still are. And here where it says rational, this drop down box, change it to say NSS. All right. And by the way, I'm going to delete that previous hydrograph. So under the hydrograph menu, I'm going to do delete all. And then this little white icon that was there before is gone. OK, but we're in the NSS module uh, model now. And if you double click on that brown icon, which represents your basin, then it brings up a different menu than it did the first time. When you double click before, it brought up the rational method. Now. Double click, wait for a second. Um, the reason why there's a bit of a delay, down here it says contacting NSS database. It's going and it's just making sure that there aren't any newer equations than it already has in the, me in, in the memory. So it has calculated the area of our basin. So we had, what was it, 557 acres and uh, there are 640 acres in a square mile. So it's calculated the, the area in square miles because the area parameter that goes into NSS is expressed in square miles. This is Alabama right now is the state that it's on. So let's switch it from Alabama down to West Virginia so that we can use our actual equations. And it's got a lot of different formulas available. Each row is a different equation. So there are some equations from 87, 2008, 1987. We want the 2010. And see how it says 5033? That's just referring to the uh, publication number. 2010, 5033. So that's the one that we need to use. Now we've got three options, Central Mountain, Eastern Panhandle, and Western Plateau. That's us. We're Western Plateau. So this will calculate the peak flow rate. So the peak flow rate for the Western Plateau, click on Select to move it over to this right side. And uh, now this is a summary of the value that it's going to use when it calculates the flow rate, so it's just the 0.871 square miles. And then in computing results, it'll calculate the two-year peak runoff, the five-year peak runoff, the 10-year peak runoff. And if we scroll down, it's got all the way through the 500-year storm. So we've got recurrence interval, peak flow rate, and then some statistical measures like the equivalent years, and the percent standard error in the estimate. So the 10-year, according to the National Stream Flow Statistics, so Q10 from NSS, the peak flow rate it's predicting is, what is that, uh, 265 CFS.
So what's the actual flow rate that's going to be going through that stream? My guess is it's probably closer to the NSS value than to the rational method value. The rational method, remember, tends to, even on a good day, it overestimates, but especially it overestimates when your watershed area is too big. Um, so all you can do is just report what the, the models suggest. And uh, so we've got two different flow rates. What we could do, like if we were doing a hydraulic analysis, is we'd look at the bridge that's there now, and we'd say, what is going to be the flow depth at that bridge for a flow rate of 265? Maybe if we wanted to cover our bases, we'd say, what's the flow depth at that bridge if we have 447 CFS going through there? We just consider all the possibilities. Um, but that's national stream flow statistics. You can get the, uh, the values that way. Once you uh, select one of the rows, so like if you select the 10 year, It'll allow you to compute the hydrograph. So it wants to know the lag time. Let's just compute that again to make sure. Compute the lag time according to SCS, 0.46 hours, which is 27.5 minutes. Remember, the other one that we had in the rational method wasn't the lag time. It was the time of concentration. So that's why they're different. Time of concentration is 5 thirds the lag time. So uh, once we've got the lag time defined, click OK, then in the background it will have written another hydrograph that we can double click on, take a look at. In fact, just to uh, show you what you can do with this hydrograph, when you've got it on the screen like this, you can right click and you can export the data as XY values. Like if you wanted to um, have a spreadsheet with all this data, so um, let's do export slash print. So basically I just, once I had it calculate the hydrograph, I double clicked on the hydrograph, right click, export print, and then of the options, what you can export is just like a picture of the graph as it appears here in a variety of formats. Or you can get at the underlying text slash data. So I want it to go into a file somewhere. So if I browse to a file location, let's see, this is the folder that I'm working in for the example today. It's on my temporary folder, WMS files. And I'm going to change it to just say, like, uh, hydrograph export.txt. And this is a file that you can open with Notepad or with Word. Or with, um, you could open it also with a um, spreadsheet, so with Microsoft Excel, because the values will be commented, I think they're comma delimited fields. So just give it some sort of a name, and then click on export and there's one last thing that we want to do um, it, right now it's saying um, export style list change it to table and then right now it's saying subsets slash points change it to points slash subsets and then export and with the file that it's just created here under the folder for today, oh, it was WMS. So there's this uh, .txt file, and I can open it as a text file, and it's just time and flow rate. Or I could open it with Excel. And to do that, you have to uh, change the default options for what Excel is looking at. So open, browse to the location where that file is saved. And it won't show up initially. We have to change it from the type of files that are being displayed. Right now, it's only showing Excel file types. But if you change it to all files, then you'll see the one we want is this text file and 
when it begins to sense that it's a text file that needs to be imported, it gives you the choice of um, how to like separate the data into columns. And our data is comma delimited. So if you click here, comma, then it's gonna create a different column. You can kind of get a preview of how the data is gonna be handled. Uh, let's turn off the tab. So it's just only comma delimited. Finish. Okay, so this is time minutes, and this is flow rate in CFS. And this, remember, is the NSS hydrograph that we had before. And so the peak NSS flow rate that it had obtained was 265 CFS at a time of 26 minutes, time to peak. So you could make, you know, a hydrograph formatted however you like once you export the data from WMS like that. Let me pull up the assignment that you're going to be working on for submission on Monday. I want to just explain to you what the idea is for this assignment. Yeah, so this is homework nine that you're going to be submitting on Monday of next week. I want you to create a tutorial for yourself. Um, chances are you're going to have some time between this class and when you need to use WMS in your profession. I mean, maybe you never will use it. But some of you may someday need to use WMS, and you're probably not going to remember what you did or how to do it or what is what. And um, so if you create a document for yourself that shows the step-by-step -step process of how to set up a rational method model, how to go through and simulate something with national streamflow statistics. So you're going to be able to uh, take screenshots, also just written narrative of click here, do this, do that. The, the assignment here, homework nine, is to do the rational method like we just did, the national streamflow statistics method, which we just did, and then TR55, which I'll be showing you how to do in class on Friday. And we're also going to, on Friday, go through the process of calculating curve numbers. So um, you could already begin on this tutorial to yourself by doing the rational method part and NSS. Uh, but what I'm asking you to submit is basically a single document that has your step-by-step -step procedure um, on how to do those different things. And um, so you can choose any watershed you like. It could be maybe the watershed that your old home place that your grandparents live at, or it could be maybe some place that you hunt or ride mountain bikes, whatever watershed you're interested in, or if you're not interested in any watersheds, you could just use one from the previous assignment. Um, they shouldn't be too big, though, because remember, you're going to be using the rational method. So, you know, focus in on a watershed that ideally is maybe 200 acres or less for the rational method at least. You could use different watersheds for the different methods. But anyways, that's the assignment. That's all I've got for you today. Just to uh, revisit the announcements one last time, remember that Monday of next week, we're gonna have that exam. And then also you'll submit this tutorial document that you're gonna create between now and then.